Well, first, I want to thank Elise and Lucas for leading worship. Uh, Louie and Hetty are in Metairie, Louisiana. Uh, some of you know that we've had this long-term connection, although it's not a formal connection, it's a friendship, with Celebration Church in New Orleans. And uh, Louie's actually leading worship there today with a few other people from Celebration. They did the mission trip there this week, and uh, Hetty taught in their uh, Celebrate Recovery class, which I think was Thursday night. So it's nice that we could go there and minister to them and with them in light of the difficulties they've been through in the last few months and how they're recovering in that city. So we have continued in this series about abundant life now for a number of weeks, and it'll last just a little bit longer. Of course, last weekend we did a special full service of worship, but two weeks ago I taught about the idea of abundant church life. And in every one of these teachings, I've been asking the question, are you experiencing abundance in this area? Now, if you happen to be a guest today or new, we have not been talking about abundance as a lot of people think of it in terms of abundance in the world, but we've been talking about finding abundant life in walking with Christ and living in the truth that comes from him in every area of life. For example, we talked about abundant mental life being based upon knowing the truth and living in the truth. And so when we were talking about abundant church life, we weren't talking about whether or not you attend a place that has many flavors of coffee and a, and a comfortable setting and a pastor with skinny jeans, but rather we were talking about, are you experiencing abundance in your relationship with Christ and your relationship with the church? In talking about this, we looked at a variety of scriptures most specifically the one in Ephesians, where it says that God has placed all things under his feet, that is under Christ, and appointed him the head over everything for which is his church, his body. That the church is the body of Christ, that wherever you go all of the time, you are bringing to bear the power and the kingdom of God in every setting. And as I have mentioned, when this church building closes today and the last person leaves, there's no church here. It's just a building that the church goes into the world. And so the church has a responsibility to be alive and active. It's not some type of institution. Far too often in the history of the, of the church, it has been organizational and institutional and functioned almost like a business rather than as an active body that is ministering to the world. And so in talking about this, I gave us a definition. And I said that the church is relational, not organizational. First, the relationship we have with Christ himself and then the relationship we have with others that it should be interactive and interdependent. In other words, we need one another. At all times as you go through life, you're going to experience points where you need other people. People to intercede for you, to help you, to carry you. They're just those valleys of life. That therefore the church should not be isolated and segmented, but being bearing one another's burdens. That members of the church are to be people who are contributors, not consumers. And if there's anything that defines much of the problem in the church across the nation as we see it today, it is the fact that we have a consumer mentality rather than being contributors. That we want to know what good can we gain from this, and if we can't gain something good here, we'll move somewhere else. But really, we are to be a family connected and contributing to one another. Because the church has a global mission and you personally have a mission to which God called you. I'm thinking about in a few weeks doing a teaching about what if. What if you missed it? What if you missed relationship with Christ? What if you missed the purpose of this life? What if you missed the calling God has upon you? See, there are a lot of questions along that line that I think I'm going to explore in a few weeks. And you see, this idea that you have a personal mission is to recognize God has created you, that you, according to the New Testament, are a priest, 
It's the priesthood of all believers. And he has anointed you and filled you with the Holy Spirit. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit for the purpose of you bringing to bear the kingdom of God wherever you go. And therein is your mission. We also talked about the church in this regard, that God has raised up apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, so forth, not that they're in any special position, but that they have a purpose to fulfill leadership roles to prepare God's people for works of service. That ultimately, God is calling every one of us to be a servant to one another and to the world. And in addition to that, that he, we are to grow together in unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. Every time we gather together and we teach and try to learn, we're, we're growing in understanding of Christ. And you see, I believe there is no human being alive who has full comprehension of God. It's impossible. And we're all seeking and growing and trying to understand so that we become mature. And you see, being connected to the body is very, very important in order that we might mature. I said this is sort of the three-point cornerstone of an abundant family life, and is that, is that you are seeking truth together with other people, and that you are serving one another, and you are in fellowship with them. Every Christian needs to be connected to other Christians who are encouraging you, helping you, causing you to grow, sometimes by disagreeing with you. And as you experience those things together, therein is abundance in church life. And do you realize that you can be in a very, very destitute place in the world I've been in churches in other countries where if they had a roof, it wasn't complete. That is, it would probably leak when it rained, things like that. At best, they had some benches to sit on. And there really wasn't a need for a sound system because it was so tiny. There were no windows. And yet, you could experience abundant church life right there, perhaps even more so than we sometimes experience here. Because oftentimes in third world countries, the church is not entangled in the world so much because the world is not so attractive there. The church in this country is far too entangled in the world and as a consequence, we lose focus and don't really pursue the mission that God has for us. But abundant church life, I'm convinced, is found in those three things relating together. Now, where I want to go this week is talking about abundant family life. A few weeks ago, I talked about abundant relational life. And I boiled abundant relational life down to one primary concept. What will give you abundance in relationships? Does anybody remember what it was? This is a test. Anybody? Faithfulness. That the cornerstone or the foundation of healthy, abundant relationships is faithfulness. And as you grow in Christ, one of the fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. And as that is manifest in the relationships that you have, inevitably it leads to abundance in those relationships. That people see you as someone they can depend upon, trustworthy, somebody to go to at a critical time. That you are faithful and true. Now, is any human being perfectly faithful? No, because we're growing. But we should all desire to be growing in faithfulness. It leads to abundance in relationships. And that overlaps some with what I'm talking about today, abundant family life. But I want to go in a different direction and talk about what I think is a critical part of abundance in this area. To start, we'll go to Genesis. Because really the whole idea of the family is God's idea. And it's, this is a quote from Genesis that says, but at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. 
And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Do you realize right there, God created the family? God could have created us very differently. We could have been one gender, and every human being would just be created by God. We wouldn't have families per se. But he chose to do it like this. He didn't create 10 different genders or many more as our society has gone into chaos thinking. That God in his wisdom created us, male and female, in order to bring this unity together that is the family. And he did what really to me is amazing. Why he chose to allow us to have a family and procreate is beyond my comprehension. But I think he did so because he wanted to reveal something about his character, his nature, and his love. Is it not true that you learn about love and the facets of love in the context of relationships with many people? In other words, you might love your spouse and you learn something about love there, but then if you have a child, what happens? It's like your love suddenly expands Bands and is multiplied to love that person. And as your family might grow, likewise, it expands and your capacity to love and your understanding of love increases. Then if you become a grandparent, you go into crazy love, right? I'm hoping for that soon. But you see, God chose in his wisdom to create the family. Now, in talking about family, though, I recognize that in a group this size, there is a full spectrum or a full range of the family experiences that we've had. In other words, there's some people that came from very, very, very healthy families. I can think of a family in this church where I know three generations of them and and. The grandparents were godly people on both sides of the family who walked with the Lord, honored the Lord, instilled that in their children. Their children walk with the Lord. They've honored him. They've instilled that in their children. And so there I see a very healthy, intact family for three generations and maybe beyond that. I don't know the generations before that. But many of us did not have an experience like that. Some of us have had experiences where you had a somewhat intact family but maybe there was part of the family that knew Christ and part didn't there was conflict over that disruption difficulty some of you came from backgrounds where your family was very fractured and of course that's an increasing happenstance in our world today some people came from backgrounds where they hardly knew one of their parents if at all in some cases, people have not known really either biological parent that they didn't invest in them at all. Maybe they were raised by a grandparent or an aunt or some became orphans. It's like my young man that I consider now my spiritual son, Arcadius, never knew his father. His mother left their village because she was an unmarried woman who had this child and she was ostracized in her village as a consequence. He was raised by his grandmother until she died, and then he lived on the street when he was four years old. Now, his example is a little more extreme than many of us might experience, but surely in a group this size, there's some people here who've had very, very difficult family backgrounds. Maybe you had a parent who was an alcoholic or something of that nature. Maybe you were in a family where there was abuse. And so in talking about the family, I understand that all of us have a different context from which we look at that concept of family. But here's one of the great things that I have seen in this life. Regardless of your family background, when you come to know Christ, one of the things that he does is rebuild or build anew for you a family. In other words, he may renew the family that you have. In, in my particular family, it's very amazing to see how many people on my wife's side of the family and mine came to know, who came to know Christ as adults or somewhere along that. They're just Christians everywhere. 
And yet, when I was very young, that was more difficult to find. And so God renewed that family and restored. Some of you have had a situation where maybe you had a parent who was extremely difficult, who came to know the Lord, who made a radical change and invested in your life wonderfully from that point forward, but it was a marked difference from what you experienced earlier. Sometimes he renews your family. Sometimes he gives you a very new family. In fact, I think for all Christians, he gives you a new family as you connect to other people. In fact, last night I said this, that many, many years ago, I, my grandmother died, my last living grandparent. And I had this friend, we were in a small group at the time, and I had a friend there by the name of Gladys Mims. Does anybody here, did any of you know Gladys? Some people last night did. Yep, there's one. Gladys was this sweet lady who was older. She was a little bit younger than my grandmother, but old enough to be my grandmother. And when my grandmother died, she said, Robert, I'll be your grandmother. And you know what? She took that very seriously for the years that she had left and really fulfilled that role in several ways. Now she's passed and gone to heaven. But I told that story last night and get this. A lady came up to me afterward and this lady's a, a bit older than me. She came to me and she said, do you know what? When my mother died, Gladys Mims came to me and said, I'll be your mother. And she fulfilled that role for her. Now, Gladys knew the Lord well and walked with him. And obviously, for her to step in and do that, see, she was becoming the spiritual parent or grandparent. And I've had others do that for me. I'm sure some of you've had that situation where God brought somebody into your life that became a parent to you who was a spiritual parent. So God has a way of giving you a special family. Maybe some of you are here right now and you are really struggling, you're really hurting, your background is really messed up, you don't understand family. God will give you a family. It's just what he does. It's part of the way he displays his love. It's why he created family. When you are connected to the body of Christ, he will give you a family. In fact, I have some friends that are from another country who've been in this country a long time that we just count them as family. And I think they count us that way. In fact, it's too good because now they give me a hard time. At one time they were afraid of me, but now they give me a hard time. But you see, when you... God will give you a family regardless of your situation. Now, the scripture also says this with regard to protecting the family. These are the Ten Commandments. I just pulled a few of them out. It says, honor your father and mother. Do not commit adultery. Don't covet your neighbor's wife or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Do you realize that all of those statements are about protecting the family? And do you recognize that in the culture in which we live, for about 60 years now, the family has been under direct attack? That the demonic has been working overtime to destroy family, and it's probably at its zenith in terms of that attack right now. And there are a lot of different ways that this has been occurring. And of course, it always works through lies and division and things like that. A lot of people have thought that because their family context wasn't perfect in some way or another that they could find something better somewhere else. We live in a fallen world. All families are broken to some extent. Do you understand that? There is no perfect relationship. There's no perfect marriage. There's no perfect family. All families are broken to some extent, but God is in the business of redeeming and renewing brokenness. And the reason that a significant portion of the commandments are about protecting the family is because the family is the essence, one of the critical components of society. Do you realize there are three primary institutions, although maybe institutions aren't, isn't the best word, that you will find in scripture that are ordained for society. One is government, one is the church, and the third is the family that the three essential components of society are the family, the church, and government. Now, we ask government to do far too many things, put expectations that aren't real. What is the primary job, according to Scripture, of government? To restrain evil and to provide for the common good. That's it. 
primarily, above all things, restrain evil. Where those who want to defund the police in a city, try that and see what chaos will ensue. Because God has ordained that there will be a government responsibility to restrain evil. And even a bad government is better than no government because evil just goes completely wild when there is no government which is a sort of what's happening in Haiti right now, that government is not effective there for a variety of reasons, and after the earthquake and other things, that Haiti is falling into chaos. It's being largely run by gangs in various areas. There is a, there is a portion of Port-au-Prince, the, the capital of Haiti, that is completely controlled by gangs. The police won't even dare venture in there because it is such a dangerous area, and it's gotten worse. And... Some of you know that we have a missionary that, who just does what the Lord tells him. He went to Haiti recently when the State Department is telling everybody to get out. That is, every American. But you see, government has a responsibility. The church has a responsibility to purvey the truth, to advance the kingdom of God, and primarily to be the standard of morality. And see, look at the church in the country today. It is not the standard of morality. It has compromised far too much with the world. The family is the context in which God creates each generation in which we are to impart truth to the next generation. My, uh, my parenting principle, number one parenting principle, is in Deuteronomy chapter 6, where Moses said to the people, these are the laws that I've given you, the laws of God. He said, write them on your hearts, write them on your doorposts, talk about them day and night when you walk along the street, whatever you do. That's how you parent. You talk about Christ, you live it out 100% of the time. But you see, these are the three essential institutions. The family is critical. Now, in all of these teachings I've been doing, I would pretty much boil it down to one or a very few essential components that would yield abundance. Like with some of the things about your physical life, I boiled it down to self-control. Now, if you are going to boil down an abundant family life, what would be the essential components? Now, probably you would say love, but we would have to define love. Are you talking about romantic, eros love? Are you talking about agape love? What are you talking about? But what else would be critical to an abundant family life? Now, I want to talk about something that I dare say most of you would not have thought of. I want to go into a direction and then come back and explain it. To do so, we'll jump over to John. Now, this is Jesus speaking. He says, by myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. In other words, Jesus said that his mission, his purpose, was to fulfill the will of God the Father. And you'll find it not only in this scripture, but in other scriptures, like in the Garden of Gethsemane where he says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. There are lots of things that indicate that Jesus humbled himself. The scripture says he humbled himself and took the form of a man, that he endured the cross for the joy set before him, the joy of liberating humanity from its sin. That there are a lot of things about the life of Christ in which he humbled himself and submitted to the will of God. The ultimate submission was what? To submit to the cross. To bear the sin of the world. Trusting and knowing that it was the perfect plan of God. So we have the model of Christ as one who submits. Then the scripture says this in James it says, he gives us grace, and this is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He says, submit yourself then to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. That you and I have a responsibility like Christ in the model of Christ to submit to God. Now, what is the opposite of submission? It's rebellion. 
You know, the scripture says that rebellion is as witchcraft. How dangerous is rebellion? Well, what was Adam and Eve's primary problem in their first sin? It was rebellion against what God had said because of pride. Why did Satan fall from heaven? Because he wanted to set himself above God, which was pride. He rebelled against God himself. Do you realize that every sin of every human being is rebellion against the perfect will of God? It's rebellion against his holiness, against the moral law of God. We live in a culture right now that is overrun with rebellion at many, many, many different levels. And you see, what is the consequence of rebellion? It says God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. If you submit to God, you stand against the darkness. But if you rebel against God in your pride, you are cooperating with and submitting to the darkness. See, rebellion leads you right down the path of walking in spiritual darkness. And submission to the will of God in everything is a wonderful thing. Now, if you were to go out and write a book about the joy of submission, do you think it would sell wildly? Reach the New York Times bestseller list? Perhaps not. But submission is a very, very healthy thing. In fact, do you know what it does? It will free you. Submission leads to freedom. I'll explain that more. If we go to this scripture in Ephesians, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, a lot of people skip that sentence and go straight to the next one that says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. But it starts by saying, submit to one another. There is mutual submission. And in the family context, submission is very important. It says, wives, submit to your husbands, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. And it says, now as the church submits to Christ. See, it started out by talking about mutual submission. It says, wives, submit to your husbands. Then it says, the church submits to Christ. How well is the church in the United States doing at submitting to Christ? Or is the church largely in rebellion? See, if the church is abandoning foundational truth, it's in rebellion. If the church is condoning immorality, it's in rebellion. Much of the church in the United States, or what we call the church, is in rebellion. Rebellion is a very, very, very dangerous place. It is dangerous for an individual. It is dangerous for a group of people. It's dangerous for any society, for a nation. Rebellion is dangerous. It is dangerous for the church. The church wants, should desire to humble itself and submit to the authority of God. It goes on to say that husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and the, and the rest of that says, and gave himself up for her, that it's talking about mutual submission. I was listening to these marriage counselors um, doing a teaching, and the lady said, if your husband gets a little carried away reminding you of submission, remind him in the scripture it says he is to die. I mean, that's what it is. It says, wives submit to your husbands, husbands Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, which meant he died for her. You, husbands, are to die to yourself and be a sacrifice to provide for, protect, and nurture her. And so it's mutual submission. If we jump back to the, the Ten Commandments that I had up there earlier, it says, honor your father and mother. What is that statement? It's submission. Do you realize that in the family, in the, in the kingdom of God, it starts with you and I submitting to God, that the whole church should be submitting to God. The family is a little nucleus of the church. We submit to God first. We submit to one another. That submission 
is a cornerstone of an abundant family life. Now, I dare say if I'd given you a quiz about that and and said list the top five things that make an abundant family life, very few people would have put submission on there. But I believe submission is a cornerstone. I'll give you a little example. When my oldest son was in about the eighth grade, I won't go through all the details, it takes too long, but there was something that he had an opportunity to do that he did not want to do. And he really, with a passion, did not want to do it. And yet, when I prayed about it and thought about it, I really felt like it was a door that the Lord had opened and that he should walk through it. And so we discussed this a few times. Every time we talked about it, I was like, well, I really think this is something you should consider doing. And he was like, I do not want to do it. I won't, I don't want to do it. And so this went on for a little while. And then finally, but I had prayed about it over and over and I really felt like the Lord was saying, he needs to walk through this door. And one day he walked into my little study at home and he sat down and he said, I don't want to do this. But if you really believe God wants me to, I will. I was like, did I just hear that? (laughs) Do you realize what he just did? He submitted to authority. He submitted to the authority of God. He submitted to me in that I would trust and listen to God. And he chose to walk through that door. And I thought it would be a good thing. It was 25 times better than I imagined, it was a great thing. And he's glad he walked through it. It was a great experience for him, even though it stretched him. You see, that's why he didn't want to do it. It was well beyond his comfort zone. But it wasn't the outcome that was so important or the experience. To me, the most important part was when he said, if you think I should, I will. Because what he was doing was abiding by the principle of honoring your father and mother. He was submitting to God, submitting to me. It was a very, very, very mature and healthy thing for him to do. Now, there are times when you must draw a line about submission. In other words, if somebody calls you to do something that is immoral, a violation of the will of God, you don't submit to that. If your husband says, look, we're going to go down and break into the drugstore tonight and steal a few drugs and sell them, you're going to drive the car, you have to say, no, I'm not. Because you see, then you would be submitting to rebellion rather than submitting to God. You draw the line at what is immoral. But the vast majority of the time, when it comes to this issue of submission, you're not talking about something that is immoral or wrong like that. In fact, if you think about it, how many times in a day do you have to submit in some way? If you drove here and stopped at a red light, what did you do? You submitted to the governing authority that said stop. If you drove reasonably close to the speed limit, you were submitting to a government authority. Anytime you compromise in some way and don't do what you want to do, but do what your spouse or your, somebody else in your family wants, you are submitting. Do you realize that learning to submit is a very, very healthy thing? Because what you are doing is dying to yourself, becoming more like Christ, exhibiting love, unconditional love. And you are dying to pride and the desire to rebel. See, probably when you walked in here today, if I'd given you a test and said, do you think submission is one of the greatest things in life, you would have gone, what? It is. I want to submit to God in everything. I don't want to ever miss his will. I don't want to ever violate his will. I want to be humble before him and do as best as I can possibly do to fulfill the mission that he's given me, whether as a a father or a husband or a pastor, whatever it is. And all of that requires submission. A very, very healthy family is where everyone mutually submits to one another. The scripture also says this, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men 
This is government, government authority, as I was talking about earlier, that God has given them the responsibility to do what? Punish those who do wrong. There is a responsibility of government to restrain evil. And do you realize this, that submitting to authority at all these different levels is a healthy thing. It's healthy for society. And God knows it. He instructs it because in our pride, we naturally rebel. It's what human beings do. Rebellion, rebellion will cost you inevitably. But you see, as you learn to submit and grow in Christ, it's very healthy. Now, there's another component to a healthy family. And I think we could start in exploring it by this statement where Jesus said, he's been asked by James and John, when you come into your glory, Jesus, can we sit at your right and left? In other words, can we be like the two vice presidents or something like that? And Jesus said to them, you guys don't get it. I'm not coming into my glory so that we can have a kingdom here. In fact, he says, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first, that one must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, or, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. When I did my doctoral dissertation, it was based on that scripture right there. That the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That the one who is the King of kings and Lord of lords, who has all authority, who holds all things together, the one and the only one who deserves complete exaltation, who everyone should serve, said, no, here's the model. I serve everyone else. The ransom is to ransom us from our bondage to sin, that we would be free, we're captives. And he said he came to serve. And he calls us to serve. In Galatians it says, don't use your freedom to indulge your sinful nature, rather serve one another in love. That the entire law is summed up in a single command to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who is your first and foremost neighbor? Your family, your church, community, that if you wanted to say, what is abundant family life? I believe it's wrapped up in these three things. It is about love. It's agape love, unconditional love. It's service to one another and submission to one another. But our culture is con very confused about the whole subject of love. In fact, do you realize some of the most loving things you will do in the family context might be some of the most difficult and miserable things you will do? Because when you sacrifice yourself to take care of somebody else, sometimes it's very, very hard. Like some in this church I've known who taking care of a, of a dying spouse. And there was nothing about it that was really joyful other than the heart connection they had, but the, the actual physical experience was hard. Or some who've taken care of aging parents and they sacrificed themselves greatly to love that parent in the latter years. That you see, unconditional agape love sometimes means that you walk down a path that is very hard. That you deny yourself, you take up your cross, you serve others, you submit to the Lord, you submit to them by doing that which is very difficult. Even a, a parent of a newborn a mom who's just delivered and gone through this physical hardship then gets the, the beauty and the abundance of no sleep and meeting all the demands of this child. And it's, it's a 24-7 job. I remember once when one of ours was very little and my wife was feeding them naturally and one night in the middle of the, now I'm a, I'm a good sleeper. I can sleep through about anything. I was sleeping through the crying. And she just punched me and said, wake up. 
I'm like, whoa, what? what's going on? Like, the child is crying, is hungry. She's like, do something. I'm like, well, there's not a lot I can do. You know, it's just part of the life. I got up, held the child for a little while, and then she finally took care of him. But you know, there's, there's some things in life that are just hard. And yet, that's love. In fact, what is the most loving thing you've ever done? That's a good question to dwell upon. Scripture says, No greater love hath one man for another than to lay down his life for him. So I would dare say it's when you lay down your life in some way to provide for somebody else. In so doing, you loved them, you were submitting to the will of God, and you were serving them. I hope you will dwell upon, in the days and weeks ahead, the joy of submission. And think about how it leads to an abundant family life. Think about a family where one rebels and the hardship that it brings to everybody. But a family where all submit, how joyful and peaceful it can be. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you love us, that you first love us, that you submitted to the cross in order that we might have life and have it abundantly. We pray that we would follow your model, walk in submission and service and love to one another. I pray for any person who's here today who is broken, who's wounded to the depths of their soul, who's filled with heartache. That today you would touch their hearts with healing, set them free, set them free particularly from fear, restore their hope. Let them know that there's nothing that you cannot redeem. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let me mention a few things before we depart. One, if you're a, a, a new person here, you can stop by the Welcome Center and we have some things for you, or you can text that number. We'll just give you information. We won't try to sell you a warranty for your car or anything like that. Um, today is the third portion of the Discovery class. So if you're new, if this is the first time you've ever been here, well, come to this portion, even though it's the third section. It's today at 1045. In other words, I'm leaving immediately to go to the Summit Building, teach that class, and then I'll run back over here to to teach the next service, but it's between 10 and 45 and 11.30 over in Summit 208. Then also this coming Wednesday, I'll be teaching the basics of Christianity uh, here either in the worship center or the apex. We are having some, we're having the carpet replaced in here this week, so it depends on how well they do with that job uh, as to whether or not it'll be in this room. Then also coming up this Thursday is Crossroads Medical Mission. Remember, that's free medical care for anyone who has a need. If you know of someone who has a need, they need to call, make a reservation. They prefer that. Although you can show up, they'll still look, uh, take care of you. Coming up this Friday is a special night of worship over in the Apex. There have been several people that have been doing these, young people, but they invite everybody to come be a part of it. It's at 6.30. If you'd like to join the welcome team, just be a greeter in some way and be a friendly face. We'd love you to do, for you to do that, especially if you're a person who just loves people, then we encourage you to get in touch with Sarah at cctry.org and, and she'll plug you in. There's a table in the lobby where we are collecting new or used SD cards or memory sticks, things like that. If you have those laying around your house, collect them, bring them. We send them to the Voice of the Martyrs. What they do is erase them. They put Bibles on them and distribute them in parts of the world where they can't distribute regular Bibles. In fact, there was a story that came out of the Voice of Martyrs where in China, which is under a lot of persecution today, there were authorities who came into a, a, a Christian gathering and someone there had an SD card with a Bible on it. They just stuck it in their mouth and hid it and they didn't get in trouble. If they'd had an actual physical Bible, they would have probably 
had difficulties. So anyway, this is one of the things that Voice of the Martyrs is doing. Encourage you to participate in that throughout this month. Our mission team has been in New Orleans all this week. I mentioned that Hetty and Louie are doing various things there, leading worship. They'll be traveling back today. So if you would, please pray for them in safe journeys as they return from New Orleans. Then also coming up on the 20th and 21st is when we'll do children dedications. So if you have a child you'd like to dedicate, you can let the office know or contact Tammy, who does the nursery. Uh, Tammy McFadden at cctry.org. By the way, if you can walk by the nursery and you say hi to Tammy or Helen, you know, they've done that job for a long time. They do it very, very well. Thank them for their service. And then also, we are participating in Angel Tree. Now, this is not in connection with any other ministry. What this is, is where our children's ministry has connected with local schools, talks to the counselors there, and gets a list of children who have significant needs. And then they put them on the angel tree out here. You can buy gifts for them, clothing and other such things that we will then take to the schools and they'll be distributed to the children. So you can pick from the tree. It's out there in the lobby now, a name. You go and buy the things that are listed and you return them to the church by December the 5th and then we distribute them in the schools. Then a couple other things for the holidays. Our worship arts ministry is doing a variety of baking classes. They have some this week. Everybody's welcome to sign up for those. You just go online at cctry.org slash bake and sign up. Just know that I will not be there. Uh, you don't want me there. I'm just telling you. My wife's a good cook, but that's not my thing. But uh, they really do welcome everybody to come. So I encourage you to be a part of those classes. They have several of them going on up through Christmas. And then, of course, this week is the time when we recognize veterans. We do appreciate veterans. And I would ask you to stand if you're a veteran. I want to pray for you and then just share one more thing with you. If you would stand. Lord, we do thank you for those who serve. Just as we talked about today, that it is a godly ordained responsibility to restrain evil. And so we give you thanks for those who've given their lives for this purpose for a season. We pray your blessings upon them as they go forth in every way that they would be models to others in the culture. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We do have... We have a table set up in the lobby from our Operation Soldier's Heart Ministry, and they have goodie bags for all the veterans. So if you're a veteran, we'd like you to stop by the table. They just have something special they want to give you that is especially for those who have served. Otherwise, I pray that you have a blessed and wonderful day, and if you want to come to the third part of the Discovery class, go post-haste out that door to Summit Building. Have a great day.